Good morning. Everybody warming up a little bit, thawing out. It's uh, great to be back here at uh, Living Faith. It's always a pleasure to get to come and to uh, open God's Word with you. Uh, we're so grateful for the relationship that our two congregations have, uh, one with the other. I uh, appreciate uh, um, uh, being thanked for the heat, but I really think we ought to be thanking God for the heat because uh, he has done such amazing things over the last several years here uh, in our, both our congregations, and uh, I am just awed and amazed by that. Uh, this morning, I am going to start a, um, at least a two-part series on uh, First Peter and uh, may extend on into future visits. Uh, if you uh, so invite me back, <laughs> I don't want to be presumptuous, but uh, uh, the book of First Peter is a wonderful book, and uh, it has uh, many things in it, of course, as do all parts of the scripture that are pertinent to our lives, but I think particularly as we find ourselves more and more uh, facing a world that is hostile to us, hostile to our faith, uh, hostile to the Lord himself. And um, uh, we find ourselves as outsiders. I went to Bible college at uh, what was at the time called Columbia Bible College in Columbia, South Carolina. It's now called uh, Columbia International University. And uh, I went there, and uh, as most of you know, uh, probably having heard my testimony, I grew up in New York City, and uh, I'm, so I'm, I'm a certified card-carrying uh, New York City Jewish man by culture. And uh, we moved to Columbia, South Carolina, and uh, I found myself in a very strange land, a stranger in a strange land. I was constantly interrupting people during our theological debates. I was raising my voice constantly. I was waving my hands furiously. And my wife, uh, who did not grow up in New York City, was graciously and quietly saying, Dan, don't interrupt. Dan, don't raise your voice. Dan, don't wave your hands around. <laughs> and I thought, I am, I'm like the biggest boar on earth, you know, just uncouth, completely uncouth. Well, then, uh, in the spring of our first year at Bible College, we went back up to New York to visit my family for Passover. And we sat around the Passover where everybody interrupted, everybody raised their voice, and everybody ra waved their hands when they spoke. And so it was really a culture war, wasn't it? It was really just, I just didn't fit in that culture because of the way they did things. Well, and that is certainly true of us as believers, is it not? The, the, the more the world continues on in the direction uh, that it has been heading now for millennia, uh, the, the less we fit in and we find ourselves more and more encountering uh, things like we're at a party, we're at a social gathering, Perhaps in our neighborhood, um, you know, you probably not amongst our, our church friends, but in the neighborhood. And uh, the, the issue of abortion comes up, and you find yourself compelled to make a stand for life and find yourself isolated as a result, if not reviled. Uh, you're visiting friends. Uh, perhaps uh, for the men in the congregation, or you're, you're at a, a gathering of some kind at somebody's house, maybe you just went over to watch a football game or something, and the next thing you know, there's a group of guys who have a computer open, and they're all looking at a porn site, and everybody's drifting over in that direction, and you're the only one sitting in front of the TV thinking, there's no way I'm going over there. Uh, your fellow employees are sitting around in the break room one day and they are having for lunch roast supervisor. <laughs> and not only, not only are they having roasted supervisor, but they are plotting a way to discredit the supervisor and are calling on you to participate in their plan. You know, what do you what do you do? It's these are these are these are all things that we find ourselves uh, dealing with, and so this morning, as we start uh, 
uh, a study in the book of First Peter, uh, I want us to be aware that, that the book was written to people who could understand our struggle, who really understood what it meant to live as aliens in their own world, in their own world. And what it takes to live boldly for the Lord in the midst of a culture that is dead set in contradistinction to what the Lord calls us to in our lives. And so this morning, I want us to be thinking about, as we begin to look at First Peter, what enables us to live an extreme life for the Lord. And I'll be talking about living an extreme life. And by living an extreme life, I'm not talking about uh, the, the, the guy who puts the signboard on and says, you know, uh, the Lord is coming, repent now. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about extreme living in terms of things like loving your neighbor, or treating your spouse the way God commands you to treat your spouse even when or perhaps even especially when they don't deserve being treated that way. And we want to be looking at the kinds of commands, the kinds of things to which the Apostle Peter calls us as his readers in terms of how we're going to live out our lives before the Lord in this extreme way. And really, it, we say it's extreme because it seems that way in contrast to what comes naturally to us, right, apart from the Lord, and what comes naturally to the world around us. So the way we're living out our lives seems extreme to people, does it not? Have you discussed or found cause to mention to people that you tithe and you give a certain amount of money each week or month, whatever it is, to your local church, people look at you like you're from Mars. Like, why would you do that? Why, 10 percent? 10% of your gross? What, are you insane? And, and so it's extreme in that regard. It's extreme because it runs contrary to our own tendencies to how we're gonna handle our money and to the way the world would have us do things like that. So what I want us to see this morning is that extreme living requires, first and foremost, re extreme confidence. Extreme confidence. And that's what I want us to look at this morning. And so I wanna introduce you, first of all, to the book of First Peter. Uh, and that it is a book that's all about extreme living for the Lord. And so the apostle Peter, it tells us, is the writer of the letter. Look with me at verse 1. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ. And so it tells us right away, the letter tells us right away, who the author is. And uh, I like that in, in ancient letters, because in our letters, what do you have to do to find out who it's from if they didn't put a return address on it? You gotta go to the end of the letter and see who it's from. Well, in ancient times, they put it right at the beginning. And so it says, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ. And so th this is Simon Peter. This is Simon Peter who is the brother of Andrew. He's a fisherman by trade. He was recruited personally by Messiah Jesus to become a fisher of men who's gonna be given a new trade. Uh, this is the Peter who is the first in the line, uh, not the first in the line of the apostles, but the first mentioned in the lists of apostles that we find in the New Covenant Scriptures. In fact, it says uh, in, in Matthew 10.2, it says, the first, Simon, who is called Peter. And so he has a preeminence amongst the apostles. Uh, he is the guy who walked on water. He's a guy who was crazy enough to trust the Lord in that boat and said, Lord, I'll come out to you. And then, of course, we know he saw the waves and took his eyes off the Lord and, and sank. He's the one who confessed Jesus as the Messiah. Remember, Jesus said to his disciples, he said, who do people say that I am? Some say you're the prophet, etc." And he says, but who do you say that I am? And Jesus, uh, Peter responds, you are the Messiah, the Christ, God's son. And so Peter was very much in tune in many ways with the Lord Jesus himself. He was one of the inner three. He was a part of Peter, James, and John, the three that God, that, that Messiah Jesus took with him uh, to places like the Mount of Transfiguration. 
uh, and when he went to pray uh, immediately before his, uh, his crucifixion. Uh, he's also the one who did what? What's he infamous for? Denying the Lord three times during the Lord's trial. I don't know him. I don't know him. I don't know him. I, I can't imagine recovering from that kind of shame and disgrace. And yet he is the man Jesus chose. And he is the man that Jesus used. He was the first man among, uh, along with John to go to Yeshua's empty tomb. Uh, uh, we read later in the Gospel of John, in John 21, he was recommissioned by Jesus. He was set back into his role as a leader. Uh, in Acts chapter 2, we read about him being the first to preach the gospel, the good news of Messiah Jesus, the good news of the resurrected Lord. Where? In Jerusalem. The very place where Jesus was betrayed, the very place where Peter had denied the Lord, he was the first to stand up and to proclaim the good news of Messiah Jesus. He was also the first to experience persecution for doing that. For, he had to suffer as a result of that for preaching the gospel. Uh, he became a leader in the believing community in Jerusalem. He was what we call a macher. He was a, he was a big shot. And uh, you see that, of course, in Acts 5 and dealing with uh, Ananias and Sapphira, etc. Uh, then, in Acts chapter 10, not only was he the first to preach the good news in Jerusalem to the Jewish people, but he was the first to preach the good news where? To who? To you guys. <laughs> to the Gentiles, right? He was the first one God chose him to bring the good news to Cornelius and his household. And in Galatians chapter 2, verses 7 and 8, Paul says this about Peter's ministry. He says, I had been entrusted with the gospel. This is Paul speaking of himself. I had been entrusted with the gospel to the uncircumcised, meaning the Gentiles, just as Peter had been to the circumcised, that is, to the Jewish people. For he who effectually worked uh, for Peter in his apostleship to the circumcised, to the Jewish people, effectually worked in me also to the Gentiles. And so even though Peter was the first apostle to bring the good news to the Gentiles, he was known as what? The apostle to the Jews. He was known as the apostle to the Jews. And so Peter, just by this quick summary of his life, we see that he was a man who was personally familiar with this idea of extreme living. He was way out of the bounds of his society. He was way out of, he was living, he was rejoicing in the Lord in the midst of persecution. Who does that? You got to be nuts, right? That's extreme. And so he knew what extreme living was about. And so we also read from the text, we, we begin to understand that the people to whom Peter wrote were also familiar with extreme living and the pressures that we're, we're talking about in terms of the society uh, around them. And so we get some insights from who the audience was. So again, in verse 1, it says, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who reside as aliens scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia, who are chosen. And so, first of all, he calls them who reside as aliens scattered. And so what's interesting is both of these are technical terms that are used for Jewish people in dispersion. And I know that this is, a, this is an issue of debate amongst scholars. I want to recognize that. But my personal conviction is, is that Peter, the apostle to the Jews, was clearly writing to Jewish people. And it's interesting to me that the way the editors of our New Covenant Scriptures, the way they were put it together, actually bunched together all the Jewish epistles. Because you've got James, Peter, Hebrews, all one up against the other, and all three of those letters have uniquely Jewish characteristics about them in terms of to whom they were written and the circumstances uh, to which 
they were written. And so he uses this word aliens, and this is a technical term for those living outside their home, outside their home. In fact, it's used in Hebrews of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, uh, who were living as aliens in the promised land because the land had not yet been received as an inheritance by their ancestors. And then he uses the word scattered. It's the word, it's the same word we get diaspora from. And so when you talk about people, when I talk about people in the diaspora, who am I referring to? Well, as a Jewish person, I'm referring to the Jewish people, the rest of my people who are spread all over the world. That's the diaspora. Dispersed from where? Dispersed from Israel, from where we're supposed to be. And so he's writing a letter to uniquely to Jewish people. And uh, in fact, the, the, this word uh, scattered is used in John chapter 7, verse 35, but it's translated dispersion, the dispersion among the Greeks. And that's a reference to Jewish people who are living outside the land of Israel amongst the Gentiles. And again, in James 1, chapter 1, I'm sorry, James chapter 1, verse 1, James uh, addresses his epistle to the 12 tribes who are what? Dispersed abroad. And so he is writing to a community of Jewish believers in Jesus who are living outside of the land of Israel. And so, I, I, how many people live in Chicago? What's the, anybody know what the population is? Just yell it out. Three million? Okay, there are 250,000 Jewish people in the Chicagoland area. I don't think that's a very big number. It's not a huge number. It's a, it's a substantial population. And, but we're a minority, right? In terms of Jews, Gentiles, we're a minority. But then you look at that 250,000 people in the greater Chicagoland area and you start counting the number of Jews, Jewish believers in Jesus and we are a minority in a minority. <laughs> and that's exactly who Peter is writing to. He's writing to a minority within a minority. And not only are we outsiders and aliens as Jews living in a pagan Gentile culture, but now we are aliens living within our own community in a pagan Gentile culture. And so the people to whom he, were, he was writing were people who understood these things. And these, this list of names, Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia, etc., uh, these are, many of these places were also listed in Acts chapter 2. And these are cities in which Jewish people had been, to which Jewish people had either been dispersed or moved, set up shop, had synagogues, were living together uh, in community. And so his, his audience was familiar with persecution. They were familiar with being a minority in a, in a majority culture and now they were getting used to being a minority within the minority itself. And so his, his audience was familiar with persecution and suffering, etc., etc. And so, so I want us to, to look a little bit at the book uh, at large right now. Uh, and that's, so that's who wrote the book, Peter, who was familiar with suffering, to a group of people who also would be familiar with suffering and trials. And I, I think one of the key verses of the book, and again, this is an arguable point, but I think one of the key verses of, of the book of 1 Peter is 1 Peter 3, verse 15, that says, But sanctify Messiah, or Christ, as Lord in your hearts, always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you, yet with gentleness and reverence. And, and we look at that verse in terms of apologetics, you know, that we need to understand our faith and be able to articulate our faith in a way that's going to make sense to people. And, and that's certainly a, an application of this verse. But when you look at this verse in its context, what you understand is if we actually lived the way we are commanded to live and instructed to live in the book of 1 Peter, people would be coming to us and saying, what makes you different? How can you not strike back at that supervisor or coworker who has been bad-mouthing you 
and publicly humiliating you. How can you not give him back? What for? Oh, you want to know the hope that I have within me? How can you rejoice in the midst of your trials? How can you, how can you rejoice in the death of your spouse that you've been living with for however many decades? Or a child who barely past his first year. How can you find strength and joy in the midst of that kind of loss and sorrow? Oh, you want to know my hope? You want to understand where my hope is? Let me tell you. Let me tell you. And so it's in this context, this verse, it's why I think this is such a key verse, because Peter wants us to live in a way that's going to provoke people to ask us why we're different, where our hope comes from. And so the, the context of that verse is extreme suffering and persecution. And what's interesting, it comes up in every chapter of the book. And I'm going to ask you to go with me. We're going to do a quick overview, okay? So look at chapter 1, beginning with verse 6. Verse 6 and 7. In this you greatly rejoice, even though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been distressed by various trials. So that the proof of your faith being more precious than gold, which is perishable even though tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And then go, turn with me to uh, chapter 2, verses 19 and 20. Uh, the theme comes up again. For this finds favor, if for the sake of conscience toward God, a person bears up under sorrows when suffering unjustly. For what credit is there if when you sin and are harshly treated, you endure it with patience? But if when you do what is right and suffer for it, you patiently endure it, endure it this finds favor with God. And then in chapter 3, with verse 13. Who is there to harm you if you prove zealous for what is good? But even if you should suffer for the sake of righteousness, you are blessed, and do not fear them, their intimidation, and do not be troubled. But sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts, always be ready, being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you, yet with gentleness and reverence. And then in chapter 4, verses 12 and following. Beloved, do not be surprised by the fiery ordeal among you which comes upon you for your testing as though some strange thing were happening to you. But to the degree that you share the sufferings of Christ, keep on rejoicing so that also at the revelation of his glory you may rejoice with exaltation. And then finally, again, at the, in the last chapter of the book, we see the same theme, chapter 5, beginning with verse 8. Be of sober spirit, be on the alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. But resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same experience of sufferings, suffering are being accomplished by your brethren who are in the world. And so you see how the, the, this theme of suffering and affliction and persecution comes up over and over again and how that dovetails with the reason you're suffering is why. Not because you're a jerk. You deserve it when that happens, right? The reason you're suffering is because you're walking in the way God wants you to walk. And you're paying a high price for it. You're paying a high price for it. And so the, the book itself points us to this, this struggle. And I won't take time to develop it, but Peter's focus in the book is not mere endurance, but it's how extreme living in the face of suffering and affliction, brings glory and praise to God. How it brings glory and praise to God and how it ties into our readiness for his return. And we've been talking a lot about that at the olive tree as I've been preaching through 1 Thessalonians. So Peter is all about extreme living for the glory of the Lord, making radical uh, choices that seem impossible to us, that make no sense in the world around us. The kinds of choices by the grace of God that are going to lead people to say, how can you have hope in this circumstance? What makes you different in this way? 
And so what enables us to live this kind of extreme life for the glory of God? What enables that? What enables that? And what I want us to begin to see this morning is that what enables that is that extreme living requires God to do an amazing work of revival in our lives. And with that work of revival comes extreme confidence. Extreme confidence confidence. And that's what I want us to do. I want us to spend the rest of our time just looking at the rest of the, the last part of verse 1 and the rest of verse 2. Because what I want us to see is that extreme revival, that is when God does the work we're going to be looking at in this verse in our lives, one of the things it produces in those in whose lives God does that work is extreme confidence. Extreme confidence. And so extreme revival produces extreme confidence. And confidence begins with this. This is an amazing thing. How many of you feel yourselves to be, you don't have to raise your hand, how many of you, how many of you feel yourselves to be confident people? Confident people. Uh, there are a few of us that, that, you know, feel pretty good about who we are and, and confident about what we can do and what we can't do and, 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 and we don't, you know, what people think about us kind of rolls off our back and things like that. But I would hazard to guess that most of us struggle with a lack of confidence, a lack of confidence, whether it's in ourselves or more pointedly when it's in the Lord. And what I want us to, to see is that, that our confidence for extreme living comes and begins, we begin to understand it when we understand God's choice of us. That, that we're entering into this because God chose us. We are aliens. We are strangers in a strange land because God chose us. We are experiencing the things that we are experiencing because God chose us. We are special in His sight. And so look at, look at verse uh, the end of verse 1 with me, if you will. Confidence begins with God's choice of you. He says this, who are chosen, who are chosen, or who are elect. Elect, that means God, it's not God took a vote, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and said, okay, you won, you got two out of three votes. That's not what he's talking about here. But he's saying simply, it's a choice. You're hand-picked. By God. Now, he's speaking to Jewish believers in Jesus, and as Jewish believers in Jesus, they might have been thinking about Psalm 104, verse 6, where it says, O seed of Abraham, his servant, O sons of Jacob, his what? Chosen ones. And it's the same Greek word here in our text that is used to translate the Hebrew of Psalm 104, verse 6. And so, being chosen by God, they were chosen. Now, on what basis did God choose Israel? Did he choose them because they were the biggest? No, because they were the least. Did he choose them because they were the most obedient? No, because they were the most stiff-necked. Did he? But God chose them. We're chosen simply because of God's choice. And that's the point that Peter is making. Just as Israel was chosen as God's people, so too these believers were chosen by God, simply as an act of his sovereign will, chosen by God. And then he says, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. And so when it talks about foreknowledge, he's not talking about that he knew something ahead of time and that God knew that when you heard the gospel, you would respond to it. That's not what foreknowledge means. Foreknowledge is, is, is a word that implies God's foreordained plan. His foreordained plan. And so before anything actually happened, God chose you. As a believer in Messiah, before anything else happened, God foreknew you, chose you, foreknew you, that you would be one of his children according to faith in Messiah Jesus. In, uh, in chapter 1, verse 20, uh, Peter says this, for he, that is Jesus, the lamb whose blood was poured out for us, etc., was he, Jesus, was foreknown before the foundation of the world. 
but has appeared in these times. It's not just that God the Father knew the Son before the world was created, but that God's plan to send his Son was hatched and decided on before the world was created. And so it's with that same intentionality that God chose us. That's a pretty amazing thing to think about, I think. Especially if I look at myself honestly and think, wow, how can that be? Why is that? And there is no other explanation other than God in his sovereignty did it. God in his sovereignty did it. I am chosen. I am in the position I am in before God as his child in the world in which I'm living because of God's choice of me. He says it's according to the foreknowledge of God. And then he goes on. Look what he says next. He says, by the sanctifying work of the Spirit. Now, what does it mean to sanctify something? It means to set it apart. And in biblical use, it means to be set apart usually for sacred use, that is, for God's use. And so what Peter is saying is, is that God the Father chose you before anything else actually took place. And he has, by the work of his Holy Spirit, set you apart for God's use. And when he, what's implied here in the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit is that it is by the work of God's Spirit in us through faith in Messiah that we are caused to be born again, that we go from death to life, that our sins are washed away and we are cleansed, that we are forgiven in the sight of God because Jesus takes upon himself the debt of our sins and our death that we deserve and imputes to us, gives to us his righteousness. This is all implied, this is all packed into this phrase by the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit. And so we've got the Father and his foreknowledge, we've got the Holy Spirit and his sanctifying work, his supernatural work of sanctification in our lives, and then he says, to obey Jesus Christ and to be sprinkled with his blood. And this could mean, a, to obedience of Jesus Christ, this could mean uh, an ongoing life of obedience. And it no doubt means coming to faith in Jesus. Obedience to Jesus meaning coming to recognize who he is, repenting of your sins, and coming to faith in him, receiving what he has done for you. And so, 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 so what I, want, I just want to see how Peter starts his letter. Do you see? He, he didn't need to do all this stuff. Now, why is he talking to these people he's writing to, to whom he's going to be writing a lot about suffering and affliction and things like that and making all these radical choices for the Lord? Because he wants them to have this foundation of confidence that their life is not a mistake, that God has not lost control, that the suffering and affliction that they are suffering for the sake of righteousness is not an indication that God is angry or upset with them or has rejected them or that they're doing something wrong and they deserve to be punished. But he is correcting all of that and he is working to instill in his readers and in us confidence. Confidence. And the confidence comes from what? It comes from embracing God's choice of you. It, it, it hurts me to think about it. And I hope it hurts you to think about it, but I want you to think about some of the implications of that. That, that he, he goes on and he says, may grace and peace be yours in fullest measure. Because God chose you, his grace, his divine enablement is available to you. His peace, that is his completeness, his fullness. It isn't just the cessation of hostility between you and God. It's the realization of circumstances. Before I was born, 
God said, I choose the one who's going to be called Daniel J. Strahl. Before I was born, before I had a spiritual appetite, the Holy Spirit started drawing me to himself and started putting people in my life who could share the good news of Messiah Jesus with me. Before I knew to ask Jesus to pay for my sin, he did it. He paid for it. I am where I am. I am who I am in the sight of God because of his choice for me. In that place, there is strength. In that place, there is confidence, not in me, but in him. And as our confidence is him, in him, we are capable of extreme living for his glory. What enables us to live an extreme life for the Lord? Extreme living takes extreme confidence. And that confidence comes from God's choice of you. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, again, we thank you so much for your word, and we thank you for this letter of 1 Peter. Uh, we thank you that you know our circumstances better than we do, and you know us better than we do. And we thank you that before anything happened in uh, the cre your creation, you chose us in Messiah. Father, may these great truths sink down into our hearts and create a confidence and assurance that will put us in a place where we will follow hard after you, that we will walk in love before you and walk in love before others, that we will love our enemies as ourselves, uh, that we will allow your presence to transform even the most difficult circumstances and relationships in our lives. Lord, because we are confident of your choice of us. Lord, we thank you for these things in Yeshua's name. Amen.